Well, hello everyone and welcome to a new Wealth Talk. This is a series of exclusive conferences held by Santander Private Banking to hear opinions from experts in different fields, such as science, geopolitics, and sociology, and help us all better understand the circumstances in which we are living and its consequences for our finances and our futures. For those of you who prefer to follow the conference in Spanish, please press the red button indicating ES at the upper right corner of your screen. Si desean seguir la conferencia en español, pueden hacerlo pulsando en el botón rojo que encontrarán en la parte superior derecha de sus pantallas y que indica ES. To ask our guests a question, simply use the question comment option located at the top of your screen, just at the center. At the end of this presentation, depending on the time available, he will answer the questions received. Today, we are joined by Matthew Goodwin, an expert in geopolitics, who will be interviewed by our global head of wealth management and insurance, Victor Matarran. Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Cristina. And um, it's great to, thank you very much, Cristina. It's great to be back in, 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 in one more session of Wealth Talks. Uh, this time we're going to discuss how coronavirus is going to change our world, which is something that I'm sure that many of you are curious about. And uh, probably we won't, we won't have all the answers, but um, uh, given it's such a big topic, we are going to look at it from a, from a social and geopolitical perspective. So questions like how is this crisis reshaping our societies? How have different countries handled the, the crisis and and how is this shaping their global relationships? Uh, are there any learnings from previous crises that we can try to look at and, and, and help us foresee what's going on? Um, so to help us answer those questions and many others, we have with us Professor Matthew Goodwin, who is an expert in politics and a very well-known analyst who uh, has successfully forecasted in the past the votes for Brexit, for Trump, and for the 2019 Conservative Party majority in the United Kingdom, which it's, I mean, you can, you can have some luck sometimes, but these are like three strikes in a row. So, um, so, so, so at least uh, it raised some, some eyebrows. Um, so good afternoon, Matthew, welcome. Um, so how does this work? Are you kind of uh, a seer or do you have like vision powers? How, how does this work? Well, firstly, Victor, thank you uh, for inviting me along, and it's been it's it's great to be with everybody to have this discussion. I I just I use a lot of data to try and make forecasts about politics. So I'm and I've got a few things right. I've got a couple of things wrong. I'm sure you're going to mention what some of those things are, but I've got more things right than I've got wrong. <laughs> I have I have some of those in my pocket. We will we will see that. <laughs> but um, so so for those of you who don't know um, who, um, don't know Matthew Matthew. He's a professor of politics at the University of Kent. He's an associate fellow at the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And he's a very renowned speaker, regularly addressing investors, financial institutions, governments. Um, he's also a best-selling writer. He's, he's the author of the Sunday Times bestseller, National Populism. Um, so Matthew, uh, let's get started uh, with a topic that will be very interesting for 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 everyone no so this crisis is reshaping how our societies are 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 it, all of our societies and is changing the way wealth is managed and distributed no so um what are we already learning about this are there clear trends appearing uh impacting the world and are they different in europe and in latam we have a big base of latin american customers here with us today uh, what do you think? What are your thoughts on these trends? Well, I think it's obviously a really interesting uh, moment in our in our history. Somebody said to me today that our future historians will have to say what quarter of 2020 they specialized in, uh, because there's a lot going on at the moment. Uh, and so I, I've tried to stay initially at the, the macro level and just try and think through what are some of those key messages and lessons that might be uh, on the on the landscape? I think the first is around the relationship, Victor, between the citizen and the state. I think we're going to come out of the back of this crisis with a much bigger state, bigger governments, more interventionism. And I put this in historical perspective. I think you can go all the way back to the Wall Street crash of 1929 and say that was the moment uh, for a correction when the markets overreached and that paved the way for a 
a bigger government. We had the New Deal in America, we had the construction of welfare states in Europe slightly afterwards. And then when you fast forward to the 1970s and you have, again, the failure of the state this time, you, you have states that are exhausted and have become inefficient. And that paves the way for Reagan and Thatcher. And it's the return of the market that takes us all the way through to the Great Recession, when, of course, the markets fail again. And combined with this crisis, the Great Lockdown, I think we're at a point where we're, we are seeing the return and we're going to see the return of big government. And, and for investors and, and, and uh, those in the financial community, that's going to mean, for example, that we're going to have to be more prepared for big state politics. I think also there's going to be a strong generational element to that, Victor. I think one of the questions about this crisis is how it is undermining our intergenerational contract. Uh, if you think about my students who are Generation Z, they're the Zoomers, by the time they reach 25 and they're graduating this summer, they'll already have lived through two major financial crises and a global pandemic. And all of the survey evidence that we have suggests that those Zoomers in alliance with the millennials are now going to look more to the state for answers. Millennials were coming into the labor market just as the Great Recession hit and now have had most of their gains over the last decade removed by the Great Lockdown. And Generation Z are entering the labor market this summer. And so we, we, we're going to have a generational aspect to this, I think, which could be quite interesting. In fact, the Pew Research Center in America just found that uh, over 60 percent of millennials and Generation Z around the world now say that the state should provide the answers to social problems, whereas older generations are much more likely to say it is individuals and individual responsibility that should provide the answers. So I think we are going to see something of a shift there. And just before I come back to you, I think also the inequality and wealth agenda is obviously going to become more important. If you accept my suggestion that the 2010s were mainly about identity and cultural issues. They were against the backdrop of an economic crisis, but we talked a lot about immigration, uh, about you know, Donald Trump, about Brexit, about all of these sort of identity questions, who we are and what our nations are about. I think the 2020s now are likely to see uh, the big comeback of these economic questions of redistribution, taxation, uh, inequality. I just looked at a paper, Victor, which summarized the effect of all past pandemics, and it found that uh, they tend to lead to a significant increase in the Gini coefficient, uh, our measure of inequality. Uh, and five years on from a pandemic, uh, that tends to still be true, that you see a significant and long-term increase in that inequality measure. So I would suggest that for societies that are already grappling with higher rates of inequality, this is going to become a much more pressing issue and it will have political effects too. Uh, it's a bit like we're trying to, you know, if you were trying to make sense of the Great Recession in the aftermath of the Lehman Brothers, you probably wouldn't have been able to see the effects that would follow over the over the next decade. You wouldn't have seen the rise of populism in parts of Latin America and Europe and the United States. And you probably wouldn't have seen the way in which our societies have gradually become a little bit more fragmented. And I think it's the same where we are today, that we understand that this crisis is going to be a triple crisis, health, uh, politics and economics. That makes it different from the Great Recession, which was a double crisis. But we also, I think, understand that the economic crisis that is accompanying this is probably going to be bigger than those V-shaped recovery forecasts had us believe. Look at the markets this morning, as an example. I think that you know those estimates of a clean V-shaped recovery are now making way for the reality that this is going to be a longer-term recovery, a longer-term return to uh, normality than we initially anticipated. So these effects, I think, Victor, are going to be long term. I think the volatility, volatility um, both in, in the markets and also politics, will stretch throughout the 2020s, as, as they did in the 2010s. Um, but of course, with volatility comes a lot of opportunity. And I know we'll talk about that later on.
Thank you, uh, Matthew. And uh, yeah, definitely, we are seeing that this is kind of being longer than a than a than a V shape. And as you said, I mean, today is uh, even a good example of it. So, what happens with this to the to the sort of global order? No. So we have uh, we have Europe, we have the states, we have China. How does this change kind of the dynamics there and the different weightings? Um, what are your views on that? Well, I think this has obviously been a very difficult crisis for China and globalization more generally. We know that we've we've seen that much higher degree of inter interdependence in trade. But what makes me anxious, uh, Victor, is the um, extent to which public attitudes towards China have fundamentally and perhaps permanently changed. So if you look at the United States, if you look at India, you look at Australia, or if you look at here in the UK, um, a lot of people are now going to leave this crisis openly feeling more skeptical towards China, less trusting of Chinese leadership, and crucially, far more likely to say that supply side chains should be brought back closer to domestic markets. Now, some of your um, uh, colleagues and those who are joining the call may say, you know, what's the problem? There is a debate to be had about China in the global world order. And I instinctively would agree with that view. But the idea that this was a temporary disruption I, I, that, that will not have a long term effect on global chains, I, I don't think is a credible one. For example, in the United States, we've now got 75 percent of voters saying they would like medical supply side chains to be brought back uh, closer to the United States. Uh, we've got surveys here in the UK, over 60% of voters are saying that they want the United Kingdom's relationship with China to be reassessed uh, and for the country to be less dependent upon China. Uh, and we've seen similar results in Australia uh, and also uh, in parts of Asia. So my um, the implication of all of this, I think obviously is that there is a much stronger public appetite to have a global debate about China's role in the world order. And of course, in the United States over the next six months, we're going to see that intensify considerably where both Joe Biden and Donald Trump have taken fairly hardline positions on China. It's not the case that one is anti-China and one is pro. I mean, Biden's primary strategic challenge is to be seen to be hawkish on China's role in the global economy because he's aware of some of those surveys and opinion polls that I've just pointed to. So I think we are going to get into a period here, a sort of you know one to three year period where that global arrangement, the architecture of globalization, global governance will be under pressure. Because you and I were talking just before this, this uh, discussion, Victor, about you know, if there is another big message of this crisis, it's that the nation state is back the nation state that we assumed in that somewhat golden window time of the 1990s and 2000s, you know, we had the sort of, you know, the Fukuyama claim about, you know, the end of the end of uh, ideology and so on. Um, the, and, and liberalism has triumphed and we were heading into that era of intergovernmentalism, of international uh, treaties and obligations and power was moving up. Well, this crisis has reminded us that it's incredibly quick. It can be inc incredibly um, uh, easy and quick to push power down. And I think the nation state is coming out of this uh, epidemic uh, in a much stronger position. Uh, and that, that could be here for the, for, for the medium to long term. I, I agree. I think uh, that's that's clearly one of the trends that we are seeing. So we, we have already met you more than 700 uh, connections, which is uh, it's a lot of people. And um, some of them are actually asking um, and probably has been ignited by your comment on the V shape is if if um, if we can learn uh, or t try to extrapolate learnings from the crisis in 2008 into this one or uh, so other things there that you we can assume that are going to happen now or is this completely completely different well i think firstly let's remind ourselves why this crisis is different from um the previous one why is the great recession fundamentally different from the uh great lockdown um first the great recession was top down it started in the financial markets and and trickled down 
Um, the great lockdown is, is the other way. I mean, it, it's bottom up. The moment the virus arrived, it, it hit everybody immediately. Uh, and it really had no regard for social class, for status, and for what position of the economy that you are in. But in the same kind of way as the Great Recession, I think it's going to impact upon our social contract in a similar way. If you think about um, some of the leading uh, images and optics from this crisis, it's been um, wealthy, professional, middle class uh, um, uh, voters who are insulated and sheltered from the economic winds of globalization and from this pandemic, who have had a fundamentally different crisis from blue collar workers, from low skilled service sector workers. My concern on the social end, before I come to economics, is that in the in the initial period of this crisis, our isolation was compulsory. It was compulsory. Over the longer term, our isolation will become voluntary and then it will become an economic luxury. Mm. And the risk facing this moment is that as these different groups have very different experiences of this crisis, whether it's you know folks at home drinking the quarantini um, or fleeing to, to second <laughs> homes, um, you know, that's a very different experience from you know the guys in the construction industry here in London who are taking the tube every day and have been for the last two months. What will that mean for populism? Well, one hypothesis that we'll have to wait and see if it's true is that maybe one of the big winners from this crisis won't be the populist right that campaigns on issues like immigration, but it may be the populist left that campaigns on issues like inequality and redistribution. But I think also in terms of the economy, we're going to see a fundamentally different response to this crisis as we already are doing. You know, take the UK as a minor example. Um, we thought we had seen the defeat of big state interventionist politics when Jeremy Corbyn uh, lost the last election. But if you look at some of the fiscal transfers that are taking place across the globe, you know, if anything, that that is um, seeing you know the the return of the big state. And that's going to have all kinds of implications. We're now entering into a world of big debt. We're going to have to get used to living in a world of big debt. We're going to have to think about how we're going to finance this crisis. And that may mean that we're going to have to, we'll see governments, I think, not necessarily going to the austerity and cuts in public expenditure that we saw after 2010. We may instead see governments trying to manage the fiscal effects of this crisis in a different way through. Um, you know, uh, through things like taking advantage of low interest rates, through trying to do things around uh, uh, infrastructure, um, corporate debt, um, focusing taxation on on um, businesses, uh, trying to um, entertain some of these ideas that have been fairly fringe until now around sort of helicopter money, uh, MMT, those kinds of ideas that seem to be gaining ground uh in in the mainstream debate so i think in many ways on many flanks the response to this crisis will be rather different and of course lastly victor what what makes our world different from 2010 we've got a lot more populists in power you know whether you look at brazil whether you look at the united states whether you look at here in the uk we've got a lot of you know, fairly inexperienced governments in office and that have not been doing a good job actually of managing this crisis. And if you look at the surveys and the polling at how, uh, you know, we've entered into one minor point, we've, en we've had an interesting time uh, globally where we've, we've entered into this moment of post-populism. We can now finally see what outsiders are going to do when outsiders become insiders. Hmm. And the response in the- <laughs> And the response in the surveys and the polls has been most people have not been very positive about that uh, that process. And uh, what's the net effect? Because uh, it might be obvious for some, but but what happens with this inequality after all this? Does it increase? Or because on the one hand, I mean, you would think it it increases because of all these effects, but on the other side, there are or there are being many kind of. Um, mechanisms to try to soften it with taxes and other things trying to redistribute and support to the lower income and so on so what is the net effect of all that is there more or less inequality 
Well, if you take the um, evidence that we've got from previous pandemics, that would suggest we're going to see a statist statistically significant increase, sorry, in the level of inequality that will last for the next five years. That in most societies, this pandemics tend to lead to an increase in inequality. As we know, the problem with this crisis is that the economic effects, whether it's scarred our economy in a fundamental way, you know, in a way, we're not going to know that until the end of this year when we've got some of the government stimulus money out of the way and we can begin to see how many people have actually lost their jobs as they come off the furlough schemes and off some of the government programs. So it's not going to be until the third and fourth quarter that we're going to get a full sense of how bad this has been. But if you look, for example, at the evidence in the US, Victor, 86% of jobs that have been lost have been lost among people who are earning less than $40,000 a year. So it is low income groups, often in the service sector that have been hit hard. If you look at the UK, we've just had a comprehensive review of who has been dislocated as a result of the crisis. Again, it's what we call elementary workers, manual workers, construction workers, people in, in, um, uh, you know, uh, in healthcare roles as well, who have suffered from the uh, crisis. In other words, the very same groups who have been driving much of our political change over the last 10 to 15 years, working class, low skilled service sector workers and people without university degrees. Those three groups have been central to driving a lot of our political change. Now, of course, in some regions of the world, Latin America being one, Asia being another, the picture's slightly more complicated because you have a, uh, you know, you, you're talking about emerging um, uh, markets that are have a very different economic history. What worries me about this crisis is it, it's exactly the same groups that were battered by the Great Recession that are now feeling the, the worst effects economically and also physically from this crisis. And if you were to take the, the raw lesson of the of the Great Recession. It's then expect big political change in the years to come, because this will trickle into politics a few years later, but it will trickle into politics and then it will have, I think, some pretty profound effects. Uh, and it might not be the mainstream incumbents uh, and those who are in office at the moment who benefit from that. Right, right. No, absolutely. Um, one. Uh, so what what all this leaves us i mean if i take a five to ten years time what, what do you think the world is is going is it going to be very different to what we had before is it going to to go back to the same i mean once we've gone through this v or u or nike shaped uh, as they could say it sometimes uh recovery where where the, now take out your crystal ball tell us where is this going to be well, inevitably, there are going to be different effects in different in different countries. I think it. I think the aftermath of this crisis is going to answer a lot of questions that we have lingering over our world. Firstly, it's going to tell us: Do do populist governments get punished if they don't perform? Whether you look at the United Kingdom, whether you look at Brazil, whether you look at Mexico, whether you look at the United States, whether you look at India. Are these particular types of politicians going to be punished by voters if they do not competently manage a crisis? Because everything in my world, Victor, in political science says the thing that really matters now to geopolitics are perceptions of competence. That as we've moved beyond the more ideological age, voters have become much more sensitive to whether their leaders are doing a good job. Now, that's one question that I think we're going to have answered. Uh, another question, which I think is more relevant to North America and Europe, is, is this crisis going to let social democracy back in the game? Uh, you're talking to us from Spain. You're, you have one of the few left-wing governments in the world. Um, well, obviously, in Latin America is a few more. But generally, in North America and Europe, social democracy has been in a period of crisis for 10 years. If I'm right, and we're going to see a big return to national debates over inequality, taxation, um, redistribution, uh, that should, in theory, benefit some of the big left-wing movements uh, and ideologies that campaign 
very much on those uh, issues. So that's a sort of second um, question that I think is important. And third, if I'm right, and we're going into this big state, big government uh, interventionist era, um, then what kinds of effects um, will that have on economic management? So we know, for example, in economics, the ratchet effect would imply that when we see this big expansion in, in the state and we see this big expansion in government, uh, it doesn't tend to go back after a crisis, that you, you get this big increase in government expenditure and government starts getting involved in failing businesses and, and, and giving state aid. And then it doesn't go back to where it was before the crisis. It stays inflated. So what implications will that have on tax and our approach to things like um, the wealthy, as one example? So early on in this crisis, we saw the French, the Danes and the Poles say that they would not provide financial assistance to any firms and businesses that chose to locate in offshore um, you know, tax arrangements. That, to me, uh, combined with the reaction in the United States to you know, some of the debates that, that were had there over um, you know, wealthy individuals moving to second homes, that, to me, is another warning sign that if we're not careful, the debate over inequality could take quite a populist turn uh, where you get these politicians trying to essentially whip up a sort of anti-wealth feeling. And Victor, of course, we had that in the UK six months ago, you know, when we had uh, for the first time really in a long time, a mainstream politician actively saying we shouldn't have billionaires and we shouldn't have millionaires in the United Kingdom. We need to give them much higher tax rates and fomenting quite a um, aggressive a campaign against uh, against wealth in this country that was defeated comprehensively at the polls. Um, but if you look at what, look at some other societies, some other debates that are that are, that are uh, taking place around this crisis, I think there's a, it gives us very good reason to watch them very closely uh, going forward. So I mean the prediction is there, ladies and gentlemen. So I, are you going to? It's another book if you fail on your prediction. <laughs> so this is this is a funny story for those of you who don't know, uh, because uh, I think when it was 2017 when you underestimated the Labour Party's um, performance, uh, you you ate your book. How was that? Well, just to be clear, Victor, just to be clear, I made a forecast that the Labour Party would lose that election. All right. Um, which they did, but I also yeah. forecast that they would not get more than 38% of the vote. And in the end, they got 40% of the vote. And so as a true forecaster who stands by my word, I, I was then forced to uh, eat uh, a few pages from, from <laughs> my book. So uh, it's available on YouTube in case you really want to bore yourself uh, this afternoon. That was a, a, a rare culinary experience. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, we don't need to 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 go to another one of those. Um, so, okay. So, in the end, I mean, we had more than eight hundred connections um, this uh, this this afternoon evening. A lot of them actually from Latin America. We have a lot of people from Mexico, Matthew, yeah. who's new. The regards. And I think, I mean, it could be a good idea to turn to some of the questions that we have here from them because. Uh, I mean, they 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 have really sharpened their pencils. So I have here one very direct, and they say, is, is Trump going to be reelected? Good question. Um, if you'd asked me that a month ago, I would have said yes. Um, everything was going in Trump's direction. The job numbers were were were, were coming back. Two and a half million jobs created. Look at the data. I spent all of my time looking at polling and survey data. Trump is still more trusted on the economy. He's still more trusted on jobs. Uh, and he's, um, if you ask voters, you know, at the beginning of the year, they felt things were going in the right direction. Now it's Biden's to lose, completely Biden's to lose. Uh, Trump's approval ratings have crashed to 39%. Uh, that's the lowest figure that he's had since 2018. His uh, economy evaluations have dropped significantly to the lowest point since 2017. So fewer than half of Americans now trust Trump on the economy. That's a problem. Uh, on the new issue of race relations, uh, Biden is about 20 points ahead. He's 
you know, also crucially, just briefly remember, Victor, what does Biden need to do to win that Clinton didn't do? He needs to boost turnout among African-Americans and among women. And ideally, he needs to win back some white working class voters. This crisis that is unfolding in America, not the health crisis, the race crisis, this is what will give Biden the big boost in turnout. Now, I'm not here to make a case for Biden. I'm a sort of, you know, I, I don't like to have my personal politics involved in the, in the discussion. But even in the swing states, nationally, Biden is now leading by eight percentage points. He's also now breached 50% in the polls. Hillary Clinton never did that. She never got up to 50%. Biden is now up at 50%. He's eight points ahead. And even in the key swing states, he's leading Trump significantly. So as of today, you know, this thing is going to be won by Biden unless some, somehow Trump can turn the defund the police message, you know, that core message from the protesters. And he's saying, you know, they want to get rid of your police. They want to get rid of your law and order. If he can use that to somehow rally middle America and, and in key swing states. But he is going into this race probably, you know, if he's not careful, he'll become the first president since George Bush Sr. and Jimmy Carter to be a one term president. Uh, and so he's going into this young adult. As of today, I say Biden. Wow. Oh, that's a that's a big change. That's a big change. Um, they asked me here um, with with all this uh, new role of the state that you are that you are saying. Um, do you think uh, that 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 a place like, for example, Europe will invest um, will 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 try to become more autonomous in terms of healthcare supplies and medical equipment and things like that? And will that kind of kill part of the relationship with, with places like China? Uh, I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, Europe has to make some decisions. This crisis has not been a good crisis for the European Union. This is my, my personal view, and some of you may disagree with me. This crisis has once again um, exposed us um, to the divisions, the latent divisions between North and South within the Eurozone. And I think Italy has had a very difficult crisis. If I were to make one prediction, Victor, it's that Italy is not only going to come out of this crisis as a poorer country, but it is going to come out of this crisis as a more Eurosceptic country. It's going to be very difficult to make the case longer term that Italy should remain within the Eurozone. And I can talk about that if you'd like more, in more, more detail. So China, not only, oh, sorry, Europe not only needs to decide how it's going to bring back genuine solidarity between North and South. And it's begun to do that, but to, in a limited way. It also needs to decide where it stands in this growing tension between the United States and China. And Europe hasn't really taken a decision about that because Europe, I would argue, is lacking the strong political leadership that it needs to make that decision. All European governments are going to face a growing pressure from below, from citizens, to dis disentangle themselves from China. That is inevitable. And if you look, for example, at the polling in Italy, which has received a lot of funding from, from China and a lot of uh, assistance from China, um, the Chinese are, uh, sorry, the Italians are clearly saying in the opinion polls and surveys that they blame China for this crisis and they want their country to be less dependent upon China. So there are some opportunities for Europe here. They could use this moment to try and reinvest in domestic uh, European-based businesses, in uh, infrastructure, um, and trying to um, fill the gap uh, that potentially would be left. Um, but we're going to need some new leadership for that. Macron's got a massive election coming up uh, on the uh, horizon, and it's not entirely clear what post-Merkel Germany looks like. And that French-German uh, axis, I think, is going to be renewed and hopefully renewed in a way that can answer some of these broader questions. Completely, completely. One, one very interesting one that I get here um, is about the, the, all the protests in the States. Um, so the question is, do you think this is something 
that it's a product of uh, I don't know confinement and people just needing to go out and and protest or or do you think this is something linked to what you were commenting before on these um, new trends and we are going to see this more and more and they actually ask if isn't it a little bit frightening i think it is yeah i think it is here in the uk we've had um mobs uh of protesters pulling down statues uh mm -hmm. in in cities with with no consultation with no deliberation just pulling down statues we've had the london mayor sadiq khan launch a review of all statues in London to see if they have any association with the slave trade. But that review does not involve citizens. It's elite led. Um, my big, my sort of historic view of where we are um, is, you know, in the 1960s, you had the big liberal revolution, which did a lot of good things. It talked about women's rights. It talked about environmentalism. It talked about civil rights. But it also did a lot of that in a way that was um, quite inclusive. It talked, you know, Martin Luther King talked about bringing people together across group lines. Fast forward to where we are today with the Generation Z and Millennials, and I, my concern is that the new form of liberalism that is emerging, what some call identity liberalism, that that is less interested in those common bonds or what Martin Luther King would call colorblind liberalism. And it seems to be more interested in, in focusing on why we're different and why we're distinct. And it, 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 it relegates the individual to simply being part of a group. So the individual spirit, the individual ethos, the individual enterprise is relegated to your group and which group you belong to. And the problem with that politics, Victor, is whether it's on the left or the right, is it's incredibly divisive. And what we can see playing out through the protests is that division. And of course, whatever happens in, in the uh, winter uh, at the election in November, I think it's likely that you know, if Trump wins, we will see many liberal protesters struggle with that, I think, and become perhaps even more um, militant in how they are campaigning on these issues. Whereas if Biden wins, I think for Trump voters, they will feel that from their view, the nation has been you know, taken over by people that want to defund the police and you know, provide reparations to African-Americans and these kinds of issues, which are actually not supported generally by mainstream society. Only about 16 percent of Americans support defunding the police at one six, 16 percent. So these are fairly fringe positions. But of course, if you turn on the television, you might assume that they're they're fairly mainstream. So we are in a more volatile period, and it is a period in which these identity uh, forms of politics are becoming much more uh, prominent. And what we need, but what we don't have, is good, responsible, inclusive leadership. Hmm. That is what we need to get through this, right? And at the moment, we simply don't have that. And with this kind of nationalism, what happens, uh, this is another question they're sending us from the UK, what happens to the UK? Are they, are they more kind of reaffirmed on Brexit or do they regret it now and feel isolated with the coronavirus? What, what is the situation there? Well, if you look at the opinion polls, nobody has changed their mind about Brexit. So if you say in hindsight, do you think the decision to leave the European Union was right or wrong? Uh, about 45% say it was wrong, about 43% say it was right, and the rest are undecided. But if you look at Remainers, 90% say it was wrong. If you look at Leavers, 90% say it was right. The deep question facing the United Kingdom, and from an investment wealth perspective, what does post-Brexit Britain look like? So we have Johnson, or what you might call Johnsonism. <laughs> and the whole strategy for Boris Johnson was infrastructure, level up the economy, and build global Britain, right? Trade deals with non-EU countries. But Johnsonism has now become coronavirus and um, a very poor management of coronavirus. So the agenda for this government has completely changed. And the economic strategy 
that we saw in the budget only a few months ago, which was about investing in areas of the country that had historically received under investment. You know, that strategy now is, is really sort of hidden by this unprecedented fiscal stimulus. And the Conservatives have yet to decide how they're going to get back to that economic strategy and what global Britain looks like. The issue at the moment, Victor, is whether we should encourage between 250,000 and 3 million people from Hong Kong to come and work and live and work in the United Kingdom with a pathway to citizenship, which is what Boris Johnson is saying he wants to do yeah. because he's arguing that they are now under threat from China. And the China issue now will mean that we probably won't use Chinese contractors for 5G, that on all national uh, decisions, all of the big national decisions now that are taken on infrastructure and on inward investment, if there's Chinese involvement, I suspect the government will be forced to review that because of this new post-COVID sentiment. Uh, and the Conservative Party, which has become instinctively anti-China through this crisis. So I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about the direction of the UK because this crisis has completely distracted us from that deeper question, which is how do we build post-Brexit Britain? Yeah, yeah. So I'm going kind of around the world, but let me finish with the country specific uh, question. So they, they asked me, how do you see Mexico in this context? And in particular, they also ask about uh, tourism. I guess they are worried that tourism is a big thing in Mexico. And is that going to resume uh, in general and in particular in Mexico? Well, I think if you situate Mexico within Latin America more broadly, just for a moment, I think it's quite clear that Mexico and others are now in a way leading our debate over coronavirus because they have some of many states have overtaken uh, some European countries in the uh, in the uh, in, in the extent to which they're being hit by by the crisis. So in Brazil, Chile, Mexico, we know that the infection rates are much higher now than they were in some European uh, states. We know, for example, that Brazil is now the second worst hit country with over 700,000 infections. And we know that Peru uh, has nearly as many infections as India, even though India has a population that's 42 times larger. So we're seeing things across Latin America that make me deeply anxious about how this crisis is going to unfold. And I think we're still at the early part of this. If you listen to the WHO spokesperson, I think it was yesterday or the day before, saying that you know, June is the critical month for Mexico and Latin America in general. This summer, I think, is going to obviously be very difficult. And that's been compounded in, in, in quite a few of those countries, not all of those countries, but a few of those countries by a lack of investment uh, in healthcare from the previous challenges that came with Zika and the H1N1 uh, flu, by the oil crisis, which has added another layer, I think, to, to this in, so, in some of those states, but also, and what the person who asked the question, I think, touched on uh, rightly, tourism. Uh, and how are we going to get tourism back to a point where it's viable? And if you look at, you know, one of the remarkable things that I've been watching this month has been the stocks in the airline industry, particularly the United States airline industry, which is just, you know, we saw them increase markedly. Yet we still have not got to a viable exit strategy from this crisis where we have a vaccine, we have tracing, we have the apps, and we can get people on aeroplanes traveling in a way that we consider to be uh, safe uh, and viable. Um, so I think the message, Victor, as you alluded to in our discussion before this call, and as I'm convinced, this is going to be a long, long recovery. You still have big states in the United States as in Latin America, where the cases and the death rates are going up. You know, this is, they are a month to six weeks on from what we saw in parts of Southern Europe, you know, maybe two months uh, beyond those. And unless you have that effective leadership and the, the clear lockdown with the healthcare playing a secondary role, it suggests that we might have a much longer crisis in parts of Latin America than we, than we had elsewhere. For investors, I still think, by the way, there are lots of opportunities uh, in that region. Anyway, I think even if you put the crisis to one side, a lot of those economies have got 
you know lots of things that that provide opportunities um you know they have hard working populations i think there is lots of opportunity in tech uh, in finance in retail i think there are a lot of undervalued businesses a lot of undervalued markets in latin america and if you buy if you assume in in short that 18 months from now two years from now you know we are going to have more consumer demand we're going to have more international travel and we're going to have uh, a lot more uh, economic activity coming out of China and North America and Europe, then I personally think there are lots of reasons to be fairly bullish about some of those opportunities in uh, in Latin America. No, I think that's a good segue for the next kind of block of questions, which are on the financial markets. No? So are you, are you suggesting with all of this that we, I mean, if you take kind of a midterm view, uh, we should in general see opportunities in the kind of prices that we are seeing now in the financial markets and that should have like an upwards trend um, uh, in the in the medium term well i was very skeptical of the initial uh, conversation about the v-shaped recovery because it just seemed you know if you looked at the markets a few weeks ago it, it just seemed mad to me that they were priced you know we've gone back almost if you look at say the american markets we've gone back to the point where we were before the crisis, but the only difference is we had, you know, 20, 25 million people unemployed and businesses going bust. It just didn't seem right to me. And what we're seeing, I think this morning, uh, and we'll probably see over the next week or some beyond, is a correction where I think the markets are realizing that the recovery is going to be much longer than they initially anticipated. We, you know, we are not going to have viable vaccines, viable containment strategies, for a significant period of time, I think, personally, well into 2021. And I was listening to the Trump administration this morning saying that, well, actually, they're betting on a very strong recovery in the third quarter, that for them, you know, this is all going to be about how, how activity comes back. But I, I, again, I just, I don't know how that is going to be possible, given the extent of uh, economic damage that has that has uh, been unfolding alongside uh, this crisis. So we've got to get to that point where we can get people off some of the government programs and schemes, get a sense of which businesses have survived and which haven't, because we've got a lot of people, for example, in North America and in the UK who are on furlough programs, but who would otherwise have been made unemployed. And that's a big difference because while they're on furlough, they're on £2,500 a month. But when they're on universal credit and welfare, they're on £400 a month. So these are big differences. And at the moment, I feel like we're in a sort of a bubble where we're not entirely sure what the true economic impact of this crisis uh, has been. And it may be that we have to wait until the end, you know, the fourth quarter, the end of this year to get a sense of where we are uh, uh, with some of that. Um, so if you look at the forecasts and you treat them with the skepticism that you should, somebody once said to me that economic forecasts are like making sausages that once you've seen how they're made, you don't really want to go near them. I think it's partly a joke, but in the future, I think some of the forecasts uh, would imply that the real recovery is going to be taking place really at the end of the year into 2021, certainly not, not sooner. But of course, that gives us opportunity, Victor, as you know, which is get in on some of the undervalued businesses and some of the undervalued sectors. And if you can find companies and firms with strong balance sheets that are looking like they're going to withstand this crisis and the full effects of this crisis and you can already see what some of those firms are uh you know firms with low debt and you know who have been investing um appropriately over the years and i think there are some really good opportunities to position now for that 2021 rebound sorry i was mute so i would add one more thing to your analogy to the sausages that economic forecast is like sausages because once you get you get to know what is there you don't get you don't want to get close to them but i would add that still everyone asks about them <laughs> absolutely absolutely of course yeah, yeah. if you're um, a forecaster you've always got something to say exactly one 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 other question linked to the market so they asked me would you bet on dollars or on euros uh, I don't mind saying I've been very skeptical, Victor. I think I talked to you before this crisis. I'm very skeptical uh, about the whole uh, eurozone area. I I 
I think we're going to be in for a really tough period uh, over the next few years. So I personally, in terms of what I've been doing, I'm much more bullish on the on on dollar than than euro. But mm-hmm. I I don't want to violate any conversations you might already be having. But I'm I'm very skeptical about what we're going to see over the next few years. And uh, they they. Um... I mean, it links to another question that I have here. So would, which region would you say would be the winner of this? Would you say in the sense uh, uh, North America or is it Europe, Asia, Latin America? Yeah. I mean, it, it's all, it's, I don't want to be difficult, but I would say it's all relative, isn't it? Because, you know, if you wanted to go into the US now, you know, and, uh, you know, you're going in at a fairly high point, even given today's events, you're, you're going in at a fairly high point. Uh, And it's quite hard to sort of see where you're going to maximize those opportunities. Whereas if you look at some of the emerging markets and you look at, you know, as I was mentioning, Latin America and parts of Asia outside of China, um, you know, I think you've got much longer term. You're willing to take a long term view. I think you've got much more potential for growth in those areas um, because we've got this unique collision of not just one but multiple crises you know somebody said to me yesterday you know we've gone through something that is a sort of you know one in you know one in a century type event where you've got this sort of pandemic colliding with the economic crisis colliding with the oil crisis colliding with populism and political volatility and you know this isn't normal this is a a somewhat of a freak event and i think that if you put all of that together and you accept that over the longer term we are, I think, inevitably going to have a road to recovery, then your upside in some of the urging, uh, emerging markets is going to be much greater than it is in some of the established develop, uh, developed markets. Um, so I'd be looking for those opportunities and those undervalued businesses that can put on the bulletproof vest over the next year that can survive this crisis. You know, the ones in the United States that have been doing well over the last six weeks We've thrown everything that we possibly could at some of those businesses, right? We've, we've, we've thrown a lockdown. We've thrown this collapse of economic activity. You know, we've thrown all this volatility and some of them have still survived and have still done well in the markets. Well, those are the businesses I think that we need to find outside of uh, North America and Europe, because if you can find them and they're undervalued, then there's massive potential on the upside. And what about the in, in Europe? What about the industries in Europe? Because I mean, Europe has had like an old uh, big industry based, obviously mainly in Germany and so on. Is that going to gain from this? Um, given that, as we said before, you get less, you you might be getting less from China and and, and some others. So does that impact that or not? I mean, it. Yeah, I. I... I think ultimately, you know, if you if you look at the fundamentals and the long term picture, a lot of things that are happening in Europe, I think, are going to bring some pretty fundamental challenges, no matter what industry you're in. Um, my personal view is that Europe is still not dynamic enough. It's not efficient. Uh, it's aging. It's got some population problems that are increasingly going to become apparent uh, in parts of Central and Eastern Europe and also parts of Southern Europe. And it's it's just not um, in a position uh, on the global stage where over the longer term uh, it can it can retain a healthy dose of competitiveness. And that's not to say there are not opportunities because there always are. But but it is to say that in comparison to other regions of the world that don't have some of those challenges with their fundamentals, you know, that have. Um, you know, room for considerable uh, economic growth uh, that don't have some of those population challenges, that don't have some of the regulation uh, challenges, that don't have large amounts of uh, government uh, intervention and and oversight. Um, I think there are more opportunities in other parts of the world. And if you're, everything is relative when you're investing and, uh, you know, it's going to be down to each individual investor. But for me, I'm somewhat skeptical of, of, of that, those particular markets. Okay, um, thank you very much, Matthew. I think it's been it's been incredibly insightful. Um, there's even one question for me, but uh, I mean, I, 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 books are not in my diet, so I, I'm not going to answer it tonight. Um, but it, it was it was incredibly. I mean, everyone is sending us comments of how insightful this was, and um, and and 
sending you sending you thanks. So thank you very much on behalf of all of our clients connected today and all of us. Uh, it's been very enlightening and um, I mean, looking forward to, to keep on commenting this. And um, I guess, I mean, if, if, if things that you said change for good, I'm happy to eat some pages of your book with you. Huh? Okay, let's <laughs> revisit. Let's come back in five years and see how this crisis changed things. Well, I hope I see you before five years. Huh? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for connecting once again. Uh, I hope it has been helpful. That's what the comments tell me. Uh, we've been slightly short of 1000 connections today. So I think it's a, we can call it a big success. Stay tuned. We will be here in 15 days or so with another session. And uh, once again, thank you very, very much, Matthew. Well, thank soon. you. And thank you to everybody for giving up their time to join. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.